Right, okay. Well, it's a great pleasure to be invited here, a great pleasure to be able to come here. And even though I did feel really guilty about my carbon footprint, I've decided this is probably the last long-distance journey I'll make to actually present only at a conference. In the next time, I'll do it by Skype. Uh, however, if I go get asked to come teach anywhere in the world, for the moment, I will do it, because uh, as my role in <laughs> what's evolved into, into this material intersecting with my life, I've become somebody that seems to be able to light the spark and uh, act as a catalyst, some sort of an arsonist, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, you have to destroy things to build things up sometimes. But uh, I got into it when I was uh, 20 years ago. I've been, I've been building with him for 20 years, so I was building my house at the time, and uh, I was more about design at the time. It was more about fitting in with the and, and reflecting and celebrating the old traditional proportions of the building and external appearance to a certain extent. So I built myself a thatched house and uh, on the mountainside in a, in a remote valley in the southwest of Ireland. And uh, halfway through, as I say, I'd built these concrete block layers that were more insulating than ordinary concrete blocks, which was the standard material uh, locally to where I live. And uh, I'd read about, I read about this new hemp building material in the back of the second edition of The Emperor Wears No Clothes, I think it was. And uh, so I thought, right, well, I'll gamble on this. I'll buy a pallet. So they have a pallet sent over from France to Ireland, and I'll try some out. I got there, to start with, I got the instruction manual that they produced at the time, and I was inspired that, well, maybe I could use it as a plaster. So I did. It was a really great success. And uh, I started to sort of talk to people about what I was doing. Several local people, friends of mine, asked me to come and have a look, repair their old stone cottages. And the hemp plaster was a perfect uh, solution for that. And the thing started to grow. And I started to publish small little guidebooks myself um, to, to, to sell with the material. And uh, then I ended up spending an enormous amount of time on the phone. People asking me about every single aspect of how it worked. And I was learning every single aspect of it worked, although I certainly didn't know anything, everything at that time. And I decided, right, I'm going to have to write a book, because this is ridiculous. If I write a book, then everybody can read the book first, and then they can answer me questions that at least are a, bit, a little bit more refined and from a bit of a knowledge. So uh, it took me two years, and I got this thing together. And, uh, it uh, worked pretty well, and it gave me this sort of reputation of being an expert, as somebody was mentioning earlier, in these fantastic presentations that have come before me, and that's a big part of, uh, of another catalytic element, I think, which, uh, apart from the two lovely ladies who gave their fantastic presentation, uh, all the other... Sorry, I... <laughs> glare. Uh, the other guys have all been presenters at uh, our symposiums that we've held for the last... Uh, Ten years now, it's the, nearly about ten years that we did our first one in my hometown because I'd started to get loads and loads of requests from all over the world and I was starting to get connections with people that had done things like Chris and, and uh, various other people around the world, especially in France. And uh, so I thought, right, well, we should have a conference because I'd started to sort of go to a few other conferences and I thought, well, we could have a conference. There's enough momentum there, enough people. And I live in quite a remote part of the world like this. Um, and uh, I thought, you know, I can't do it somewhere else. I, I can't afford all that stuff. I can do it in my local town, and the hotel gave us a good deal and everything. So I got, in the event, 70 people to come in the middle of nowhere about a subject which hardly anybody knew about. And uh, we decided at the end of that to form this association. So I've made myself director of this because it's not some sort of huge corporation or anything, and I want to guide it for the moment. And I've got a great team of people back in Ireland with me that help me with that kind of aspect of it, especially my wife, who has taken on the role that's the gr most gruesome of all, all the accounting and the bookkeeping and the answering sort of official emails and getting the apps to work on the phone. And oh, God, it's amazing. So, you know, behind every semi-successful man is a really together woman. Right? <laughs> or other partner. I don't mean to be... I just realised that's a very sexist thing to say. Or your, any other part of, and part of your family. It might be your children, even. Anyway. So, time to get serious. Now, 
I've made you laugh, so obviously it's not that serious, but it is time to get serious because as director of the International Hemp Building Association and many other parts of my life in my work as a consultant and teacher in my local community, especially about issues such as sustainability or biodiversity and about tackling the really important things that are coming our way. So uh, we have to get serious about the bigger picture. And we've had some fantastic presentations about all the details of all many, many aspects of what we're trying to do here. But there have been a few bits which I'm very glad to say haven't been mentioned very well, and I can, I'm able to fill them in, even though the presentation that I prepared was supposed to be at the beginning of the day. So it's worked out pretty well that everybody's been talking about the same stuff, but we've all come at it from slightly different angles, and I've got another few angles to come, so it's worked out all right. So we've come a long way from the very first hemp building project, which was done by this fantastic, unusual guy called Charles Rossetti, and he was asked, because he, everybody knew he knew a lot about old materials, to repair this old oak-framed house on the left here that had been the, the, the residence of a famous French writer called Flambert back in the 1600s or whatever. And uh, so he knew that he had to devise something that was going to work with this old oak frame because for the past sort of 20 or 30 years, all these buildings have been ruined by having cement plastered upon the outside of them. People thought it was hard and strong and it would stop this frail, weak stuff inside it from being damaged. But of course, it did exactly the opposite because it trapped the moisture inside the material, so the material swelled, popped the plaster off, and then started to fall out. And this is what happened to this building. And this is a building that was mentioned earlier on, the Casa de Luce in, in, uh, in, in Bicelli, in the, the Adriatic coast of Italy built with a whole range of different materials, and including hemp, with several different versions of hemp, hemp plaster, hemp blocks, sprayed hemp application, and hemp fibre as well, and other recycled materials, and stone, and, and cork, and all kinds of recycled materials in this building, and designed to be an amazingly efficient machine, with air cool, cooled by air from the sea, and that kind of thing. It was the most amazing project to visit because I was invited there as they'd started to build it and they had the concrete frame and they'd started to install the hemp elements and they wanted to explain to the local town what they were doing and why they were doing it. So they had this four-day open day. The first day was all the engineering students and engineers from the locality. The second day was all the architectural students and architects from the locality were all invited in. And the third day was the day I was invited to come and talk when they had all the local town people, all the dignitaries, the football club owner and the mayor and all these people and all these academics from the universities and a quite a few other members of the public. And we gave presentations about the, the sort of background of why we were doing this, and then there was a guided tour around the building. We saw all the different stages and all the different examples of different ways they were using it. And on the fourth day, they invited the whole city in. Come in, and they had stalls, people selling hemp food, hemp clothing, and all this stuff. And it was the most cleanest, most organized building site I'd ever seen in my life. It was incredible. It was absolutely spotless. It was under the sort of managership of Paolo Ronchetti, who's the guy that came to my first hemp building symposium as a student and went on to form the most amazing company in Italy and done the most amazing work since. So we've come a long way into, in, in, in that way. Where I sort of saw it happening in England, we're in America now, but in England the first sort of big steps were I was invited to the Eco Build show where people that I'd also introduced to hemp building, people like Tom Woolley and Ian Pritchett from Lime Technology um, were starting to demonstrate what they were doing and they wanted me to come in and give a sort of explanation as to why this was working um, on a, just on a talk level. And then a few years later, the BRE, who've been talked about before, built this f fantastic, or had this building built on a small little site they have where they have these innovation buildings. It's called the Innovation Park in Watford. And their opening day, where they invited the public in to see this building, it was very hot, especially for an English summer's day. It was a very, very hot day, and everybody was trying to get into that house because it was much m more comfortable than all the other high-tech, big, fancy houses that have been built around it. So that was a big thing, but again, a big public moment where things started to get bigger. So how can we improve promotion? What, what, what do we have? What is this? 
this, this, this material, this stuff that we have, you know? Huh? <laughs> what? Well, I've heard, of, you know, there's all sorts of uh, CBD, but... That's what we got. That, that's what this is, right? And as Chris has said, there are other materials that have very similar capabilities. But my experience has been a little different to his. Several of those other materials that he mentioned haven't worked out so well. And there are certain elements like rice husk does not work as a hempcrete. It's been tested with these scientists in France. And they didn't have very good results, particularly with, with, uh, with, with, um, with sunflower based either. But they did with sugarcane bagasse. That worked really well, and so that's becoming a parallel project in Costa Rica with hemp. So what is this bioengineered device? Well, like the logo for the US Hemp Building Association, it's this stuff in the middle of the plant, the skeleton of the hemp plant, the thing that holds up and pushes up those flowers up into the sky as it shoots towards the heaven, surrounded by these fibers that give it the sort of reinforcement to withstand the wind. Oh, but it's that skeleton, and that skeleton, when you harvest it and separate it from the fibres, gets broken up into these particles. But the inside of them is pretty unique, not because it's those particular elements, but it's the particular size and strength and th the thickness of those walls that make it work in an extremely w efficient way. So we have so we have three different elements, which is why R values and U values are. Are, are not the right way to measure it. I challenge Chris to be a bit more pirate in the challenging and trying to change those things, right? Because we do have to have, for all the natural materials you were talking about, a different way of measuring things. It's really important. And so what Liam and I are working with, because uh, Liam's doing experiments with all my recipes for, uh, for uh, Greek mixtures, um, we're trying to find what effect this stuff has in relation to the binder, right? And all the different formats we could possibly have. But this stuff in the middle here is the, is the, the common stuff, the stuff that is the same all the way through, pretty much. And what it does is it holds heat, it insulates it, stops through it, so it has pockets of air that insulate, it has walls of those, those pockets that hold the heat, and then we have punctured little perforations in those walls that allow the water vapour to go through. And it's just the right variation in pressure structure between the tubes that take moisture up through that skeleton when it's growing and these box-like structures, which are like this re the sort of structure around those tubes. It's the difference between that that helps regulate the way the water vapor moves through. And so as the water vapor is evaporating and condensing, evaporating and condensing as it moves through, it's re I've sort of shown this sort of purple stuff in the middle. It's resonating a little bit of heat. It's like it's squeezing out the heat from the water vapour into the thermal mass of the building and then helping to use that to regulate the way the moisture moves. So the inner surface of the wall is doing this little trick which is pushing the other moisture out. So it's a really complex bioengineered device. So, what is a hemp house? And we've, uh, talked about that, and you could say, what is a straw bale house, what is a, any kind of house that's built with natural materials? And there have been many things said about what hemp can do and what it can't do, but it can do most things. And I was asked earlier, you know, can we make hempcrete beams? Well, I, I was thinking about that, and I, I didn't really give as thoughtful an answer as I might have done. I saw hemp are making concrete beams. They're making U-shaped hempcrete blocks in a long section that they're then putting concrete and rebar inside. And uh, so that is creating like a window lintel. That's basically, I'm not sure how it would also create a sort of what we call a wall plate around the top of the wall to support the roof. But whether it would span a big open span, I'm not so sure about that. But arches will. Arches are something that have been used for a long, long time, way before we had concrete or RSJs or you know, that sort of thing. Right? The Romans used loads of arches, as did everybody after them, and the Egyptians before them, and the Babylonians. So this is a house. These are two totally different houses here. This is a sprayed hempcrete house with a timber frame. And it's a house that had a hemp floor and hempcrete in the roof, as Alex has shown in some of his projects. So it was a complete envelope. And that's, that's what it is. It's an envelope. Yeah, it can be structural, as you can be seen in this building, where those are hempcrete blocks, and 
the, the house, built to the right size, obviously, of a Moorish type influence in Spain, where it's hot and arid, so it would be appropriate for any hot and arid country or area in places like America. And it's a flat roof, it's got incorporating old traditional elements, but using hempcrete to make the whole building work even better. Right? This one here, this is using well, quite an old fashioned system in a way of post and bean type timber. And we're, again, we're looking to create that whole envelope because that's what a hemp house is. If you, as we were saying earlier, if you just build like the hemp walls and you put plastic siding on it or glass fiber insulation in the roof, it's, it's sort of a hemp house, but it's not, not what hemp can really offer. So, how to make the most of the material? How can we you know, really like, use it in the very best way so that we're getting the very best out of it? Right? Because it's all very well just using it, and, but how can we really maximize that? Not again. So, how can that have anything to do with home building? Right, so. A cannabis building design has to be appropriate, right? And that relates to a lot of different building systems and different, different uh, building of approaches around the world, but we've got away from what we should be doing, right? We should be looking at where is this building? What's the weather like? What's the climate like? What's it actually going to have to survive in? Just because you like the look of a house that looks like it came from Sweden, doesn't mean it's a good idea to build it in Texas. Right? Because if you build it in Texas, then you end up with having to put all sorts of fans and stuff in the attic space to suck out any hot air that might get in. And then you have to put metal grills over the windows to stop any sunlight coming in, so you're living in a sort of grey, dark environment. And you have to have an AC machine that sucks all the heat out and makes it like a fridge. Right? So, we have a lot to learn from this term called vernacular, right? And this is something that architects have forgotten all about, right? It's all about design and style. Ooh, look how stylish my building is. I, I have a style, I, you know, I have, I, have a, I have a look. Right. But there's no point dressing up like an Eskimo in the Sahara, is there? So here we have two totally different examples of a climate and two totally different designs of a building. Well, they're hot and dry, so they're off the ground. A bit of air moving underneath them, nice and cool. They haven't got, they got sort of minimum wall area because they want to take advantage of all the shade that might occur. And they've got nice overhanging roofs to make them shady. It probably rains every now and again, at least they hope it does, because otherwise there's no rainy season and they haven't got anything to eat. But these are actually food stores. Right, so that's how they keep the food nice and comfortable and dry and safe to eat. This is a house, but it's in Denmark, where it's cold and damp, a bit like where I live, and a bit, more, a bit colder than where I live in the southwest of Ireland. This is, they would get a lot more snow than we do. We hardly ever see snow, but, or frosts even, but it really wild and windy. So wild and windy places, you have to tuck the buildings down in the landscapes. They're not standing up and having the elements tear away all the sort of energy Acquirements you wanted, the energy p b b benefits that you wanted from your materials, you've got to design it to fit into the landscape. It's got to be part of where it's built, otherwise, it's totally crazy. And it's not hard to look around in rural areas and see how people used to build things. And I've seen on the way driving up here, I've seen timber buildings in wide open, really must be hot places that are freezing cold in winter and blazing hot in the summertime. But some of them, I could see, had these sort of towers built out the middle of the roof, where the heat was being got out of, you know, got rid of. So because they didn't have AC, you know, they didn't have any of that sort of stuff, right? But they managed to survive there. And there are all sorts of tricks that people have used for hundreds of years that have either cooled or warmed their buildings with little ecological impact. No AC. <laughs> I can't live without AC. That was a comment actually that uh, 
Mark Rinlindy, rest, rest in peace. God love him. Right, he did a, I did a hemp running course at his house and his uh, wife had been very busy with her work and looking after the kids to, to really, really know what we were doing. And we were sort of dismantling this shed that was in their, their back garden, which had been the previous owner's sewing workshop. And uh, she, she was just sort of like, yeah, oh, my husband just playing around. So on the, on the second day, she came in to see me just to sort of, what exactly are you doing in here, Steve? So I said, right, well, what we're doing is we're taking out that sort of hardboard type siding you got there and that tar paper and the really weak sort of plasticky cardboard stuff on the outside. And we're just keeping the frame there, but we're casting the hempcrete around it. And we're going to open that glass window that's up in the middle of your roof or create a skylight and a ventilation thing in the middle to take the, the heat out. And we're going to you know, remove that AC unit there and continue it all around. And she went, what? Oh, no, I like AC. Isn't that the whole reason your husband wants to do this is because you're not going to need the AC. And she was flabbergasted. It was like, wow, that's, that's amazing. And these people lived in really hot places. These people lived in wild, maybe windy, rainy, wet places. They were probably quite comfortable in those places. I've been on a lot of very old vernacular style buildings and they're amazingly comfortable. In the same way that I've been into loads of hemp buildings, and they are amazingly comfortable. When they're done right, and most of them are. <coughs> now, uh, Alex was talking about the cat building earlier. So as we're talking about design, cannabis building design, you notice that it was a big round circular building, and that's the auditorium. Now, if you're building an auditorium, the first part of that word should make you realize that you have to understand sound, right? And the worst thing in the world is trying to talk in a circular room. The echo, the voice just gets like It's crazy, so that spoils it a bit. Okay, it's a nice hemp building, looks all right, the nice accommodation blocks, but there are, you know, there are just, the building is built in an old slate quarry. A slate is that you know, shale rock that can split very thinly, and they, for many years, in this part of Britain where that that building is, they exported thousands of tons of that stuff as roofing material. So you'd think that a building that was designed to be ecological, built in an old slate quarry, would have slate on the roof. No, zinc, zinc sheeting. It looks more stylish. Right, and um, so you've got hempcrete walls, right? You understand it's a natural building, so you know how are you handling the rain? In where we live in, in Ireland and, and that part of Wales, we get a lot of rain and some of it comes horizontally, but it comes and it can last for quite a long time and we don't get loads of sun to dry it all off. So we want to better keep the walls of the buildings dry and we usually have what we call gutters or some people might call them chutes, the downpipes to take that rain that's coming off the roof into a drain and away. So it doesn't just pour down the walls. So, of course, the architects that are building this building in Wales don't put any gutters or chutes on it so that the water streams off, not so much down the walls, but landing on the ground beneath and splashing back up onto the walls. So, again, that's not good cannabis building design, right? That's definitely not CBD. <laughs> oh. All right. Now... These, I understand, are referred to as McMansions. Well, the reason I use this McMansion is because it's owned by Connie, Connor MacGregor, the famous Irish fighter. Again, another stereotype that, as Liam said, isn't really <laughs> valid these days, but he's, an he's a bit of a throwback. You could say. <laughs> but uh, he lives here, right? Now... I could never justify that. How the hell can you justify living in a place like that? Never mind having two or three of them, right? Which a lot of people seem to think is quite justifiable because, well, I worked hard and I'm ambitious and well, I do a lot of work around the world in all sorts of disadvantaged places like Haiti and Nepal and places like that. And uh, I'm very familiar with places where people have nothing. 
<laughs> very, very, very little. So the, the chance for them to build any kind of home, never mind a hemp home, is pretty slim. Right? They're living in a shack maybe, or in, a, in an apartment in a horrible concrete building with an AC probably. They can't afford and they can't turn on anymore. And anyway, the electricity supply isn't regular enough to have it on all the time anyway. So I wouldn't be into, even though initially people have imported hemp materials into all sorts of parts of the world and they've built landmark buildings, they've built iconic buildings. But the message we're trying to get across isn't that one. Right? At least I'm not. <laughs> oh, tiny homes. It doesn't seem to be quite as much of a craze as it was, but still, it's uh, still something that a lot of people, yeah, tiny homes, hemp tiny homes, even better. It's an American tradition, obviously. You know? This is uh, <laughs> this is Seattle in the crash, in the, the first crash, in the Great Depression, right? Now, things hadn't built up quite as crazy as they did by 2008, but it was still a similar type of thing. Now, they've uh, tried to put these breaks in, so they've had these algorithms that control the market, right? So A, you can control what goes up, and B, you can control how fast it goes down, and if there's anything like a crash happening, uh, we put the brakes on, oh, we've, we've closed trading for a while to stabilize things. So, obviously, that's not what most people are going to aspire to. But we are heading into crazy times. And this is what I'm, why I'm saying we have to get serious. Because as, as was inevitable, this meeting, this summit, has had a lot of people talking about, in a way, business as usual. That we're going to keep on doing these things that we've been doing for the last 40 years. We're going to try and do them differently, but we're, you know, we can't actually not do them. Well. That's great if we've got a choice. But I've been standing back from this issue for about 45 years of my life, a bit more, yeah, about that anyway, when I was a young hippie in England, and there used to be these sort of hippie newspapers, way before the internet, of course, but full of the same sort of stuff, except actually less full of all the sort of rubbish that you might get on the online these days, but full of interesting articles about stuff that was happening that the mainstream media didn't touch on. One of them being the publication of The Limits to Growth. Right? And that made me realize that that intuitive feeling I was getting from LSD <laughs> was probably right. that we had to do this differently. This wasn't right, you know. <laughs> so whenever there was a bit of an upsurge of other like-minded thinking individuals who were saying, we've got to change things, this isn't right, you know, and there are problems coming anyway. We've, we're running out of this and we're running out of that, and peak oil started to be mentioned, and there was these ugly-looking people in suits who kept coming on going, that is an absolute rubbish, we have endless supplies. Because this is just going to go on forever and ever and ever. So, is that a real future? So, what is the future? What's, how, can we, how can we ever predict the future? I don't know. Cons what does it consist of? You know, what did, what's, what, what, what's coming along the line? Hmm. <laughs> well, I'm... Uh, uh, right. That is what is happening. And the really unfortunate thing is that all those people in every different branch of science who've all come to the inevitable conclusion that that is what's happening. And it's very likely that the fact that we've been digging up all this stuff that the planet stored away underground out of the way so that we had the right type of atmosphere to live in wasn't a good idea. Right? And that we've done so much of it that we might have actually unbalanced this beautiful goddess that we inhabit that floats around in space. So, you know, we, Alec, uh, Chris was talking about this earlier. Now, all I can say is that there are 
life cycle analysis has been done by the EIHA and they've published a new one recently in comparison with other natural fibres used predominantly in insulation but also in the biocomposite industry. And hemp has proved very well in those and they're there as an open source resource on the EIHA website. So if you need those figures, they're already done. And uh, that is a figure that several other people have come up with and I'm actually underestimating what the real figure is because it depends how you burn the lime, but that's the most, that's actually Tradical. In fact, that's a bit better than Tradical, but that's, well, that, no, it's a bit, it's a bit, bit uh, it's a bit less than Tradical. Tradical was estimated to be 110. I'm not sure of what exactly the life cycle their analysis has done, but other lime products emit more CO2 if you're just burning lime, but they sequester more of it. Now, I, again, would not so much take issue with what you said, Chris, but that we have to use all the technologies possible. And that if we haven't got much time, then possibly sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere mechanically, as well as planting as much land as we can with forests and protecting the ones we have, and then using that CO2 to make all sorts of other products, especially in speeding up that absorption of CO2, which you were saying you know, takes a long time normally, if we can speed that up, we might be able to help all the other things we might be able to do put the brake on. So, what's coming? Here in, in uh, this part of America, it's like uh, we're not going to be bothered about sea level rises particularly. That's not really an issue that's going to bother most people around here. But anybody who lives in any of the coastal cities anywhere, anywhere in the world, excuse me, it does matter. And it's going to matter quite soon. Because all the models that they've, that they've evolved so far have all been outstripped by reality. Because all the things that we've always mentioned alongside some of the major figures, just like CO2 emissions or methane emissions or whatever, are things like the albedo effect, where the fact that the, the lack of ice, reflective ice on the, in the world is meaning that there's more heat absorbed by the planet, that the weather systems start to accelerate each other and that droughts lead to fires and then rain leads to mudslides and so all sorts of things are going to be happening but they are already happening. We're assuming that it's like the new normal that San Bernardino just flowed into the sea or that paradise burned to the ground. Oh, well, that's just normal. It's not normal. Now, we're making it worse by building things out of crazy materials but how do we use hemp to address those two issues to start with? Well, flood defense. Now, you know, this is a crazy engineer's idea that we have houses made of brick propelled upwards on hydraulic rams should the need arise. Right? <laughs> people have said online, especially people like Mark Emery in a conversation with Daryl Hanna online said, oh, hemp even floats. Well, it doesn't unless you put it on something that does, right? <laughs> so. But those are houses that have been built and designed in Holland, where they have a lot of sort of nervousness about sea level rises because half, half the country is below sea level. That you have houses built on sort of rafts that can, if they're secured to some sort of mo mooring post, rise up and down, or maybe rise gradually, continually, maybe. So, what about fire? That's a much more scarier prospect in some ways because it can happen so much quicker, right? And, uh, I didn't reckon, remember that being something they told me in the whole food shop. Oh. CBD. Comprehensive burning defense. Right? Which is what hencrete is. It really is amazing. Right? It, you can put a blowtorch up against it and it, it, it incinerates. Well, it, just about everything incinerates right? if you put a flame up against it. But it doesn't burst into flames. It just doesn't, the structure of it won't allow that. Right? It just doesn't happen. So how can we use that? And what are the implications of that? So we... I know it's fireproof because I 
got my, gave myself the most boring video in the world award. <laughs> you can see it on YouTube. Put a blowtorch up against a big block of hempcrete, one that has one of those disposable gas canisters. Get an alarm clock so that you can see it's got a big face on it. You can see what's going on rather than one of those electric things, right? And then stick a video camera there. Set light to it and see what happens until it runs out. <laughs> Which is what I did. Took about seven or eight minutes. And the initial sort of incinerated circle and the scorched bit around it didn't change pretty much the whole seven or eight minutes. It stayed the same. And as soon as the gas ran out, took the, chain, the, the, the burner away, whoops, whoa, I took the, 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 the blowtorch away and touched it with my finger. And it was totally possible to do that. It was warm, but it wasn't hot. So immediately, it didn't, it didn't absorb any of that heat enough to start burning the whole of the rest of it. See, So it is fireproof, but... You will not survive in a fire like that. Now, that's not a hempcrete house, but the fire that caused that house to burn in paradise, in California, the fire that caused that is a forest fire, where the, it's so intense that not only is the plastic and rubber of your tyres or your, or your shoes melting as you stand there, but it'll peel the skin off your face and it'll just incinerate you. Trees explode, full of resin, they just explode. So if we build a hempcrete house, how can we do that to protect against that? Now, I think the best design, which is one that still would need a lot of sort of market uh, change to sort of accept, is a dome. Because a dome is sort of aerodynamic, it doesn't have any edges to sort of catch hold of and light, and it would also survive in a tornado, an earthquake, a lot of things. It's quite a, and it's something we can build quickly, especially in an emergency situation after a situation like this. But to prepare for a situation like this, don't bother thinking about staying inside that house while the fire burns around you, because you will suffocate. The fire will suck all the oxygen out of everything, and there will be absolutely nothing for you to breathe. So don't believe you can stay in your hungry house and the world burn down around you. But you might to protect your stuff, so at least your stuff's still there. And that relates to something I often ask people, especially when I'm at building shows and that sort of thing, is that what do you, would you build, what would you use to build a nest? Because I consider homes and workspaces to a certain extent should have that sort of nest quality. And concrete's not the first thing that comes to mind when you're thinking of a nest, but it does if it's a like maybe a safe deposit box for all your stuff. Right? And a lot of big houses are built purely to store stuff, right? especially fancy stuff that makes you look like, oh, I'm really rich, or <laughs> stuff that uh, is just sold to you because you've got to change the decor in your house once every two months. But it will protect that stuff inside it and maybe your other valuables, ancestral heirlooms or whatever. So, Hemcrete definitely has a part to play in what I'm going to cause or call resilience building. Because sustainability and all those sort of things are great, but um, we'd have to start doing something about climate change. And of course, one of the things that is re really looked at as a problem with global warming is CO2 and, or, and the, the use of misuse of carbon. And getting efficient is a big part of that. So putting hemp building to the side is like, how are we going to power this hemp building house? And if we still use this old paradigm of generator, transformers, transmission, transformers, you're losing so much power. It's called the energy return on investment. It's like really low. You've started off with all this energy, and by the time you get to the house, it's, it's, you know, it's about a quarter of it left or less. So that's got to change, because that's insane. We're just throwing it away. A bit like the food situation, where we're producing all this food and about half of it just gets dumped. It's not the right shape, size, colour, or too much of it that week, or it wasn't advertised on telly. Or on <coughs> so local energy generation and smart grids to a certain extent, although I've learned recently that some elements of smart grids are 
powered by 5G, and I'm very against that because that's just going completely crazy. 4G is bad enough, and it could well be responsible for things like bee colony collapse. They bring in 5G, then goodness knows what will happen to the insect population and, and the plant, plant life because it's been well proved that there are all sorts of species of plants that are very susceptible to electromagnetic radiation. So, how do we, we need to store the power? So, what are we going to use to store the power? <laughs> all right, well, actually, there is some possibility with this but we need to develop these other bits first. And this is happening. And if we can build a battery using carbonized hemp and some other things that we're working on at the moment with one of our partners, we would better build bricks that were batteries. And that would change things absolutely radically because we could make the building the battery. And we could have the, 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 the power source on the roof or from the wind turbine or your gas, gasification unit. And you can store it in the house because that's the storing bit is the problem. Or it could be a local community thing, wind crofting as they call it sometimes, where maybe three or four people living in an area decide to share their power together and they, they all put together and get a bit more capacity maybe on the all their roofs combined or some other space somewhere else maybe. But that's what's going to be really important. That's what's going to really, really radically change things. And it's something that hemp, probably amongst other things, can provide. So we really need quite large markets to be able to justify the large processing plants that people have been talking about here. We need to find, just a thing, and there are all sorts of comments made today that I would have been rude to interrupt every one of them. But uh, CBD stalks can be used if you're processing them with a hammer mill, you're, you're going to be getting fairly good hemp herd type material. The fibers probably won't be as good because CBD plants don't really grow in the same way as industrial plants do. But you know, it is possible, and especially if you're getting small particles, as I told Bruce was it or somebody earlier, great for plastering. Small particles are fantastic for making a plaster out of. So hemp building can provide some of the tools we need to address the urgent situation. But it's an inconvenient fact here. Now, Al Gore, you referred to his thing as the inconvenient truth. Um, uh, if you just could reduce your footprint by 30%, you'd be as bad as us. Right? And we've got a long way to go, or at least we're fairly like guilt-ridden about that now in Europe, at least some people are. You know. Certainly there are people who are in complete denial and refuse to change their lifestyle. Not eat any meat, you've got to be joking. Reduce even my meat intake a little bit. No way, why should I? Have you got grandchildren? So, it's not going to be easy. And I'm not pretending for one moment. So, tools, uh, what am I doing? What happened there? <laughs> what happened there? What happened there? There you go. Um, that one. No, the one above it. Right. So, what I was going to say <laughs> is that there's some great information out there, right? And. Uh, I'm a great one for recommending books, and Alex as well. And I, I must mention that Alex, Alex, as all we all do when presenting, you forgot to mention something. And that is the fact that he's obviously a descendant of pirates with a name like Alex Sparrow. <laughs> but books are great things. And here's three books I'm recommending to everybody at the moment to get serious, right? And the first one especially is about getting serious. Because I was in Paris when we signed the Climate Accord. I was part of a team of people trying to present to the public and to any politicians that were interested, although very few of them were, how hemp could contribute to us addressing this important issue. And since then, nothing has been done. Not even a bit. In fact, it's got worse. So, you keep talking about, oh, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. Most people on the planet have nothing like as much as we do, either in America or in Europe. 
they, they want more, right? And they look at us and like, what do you mean we can't have more? Look at all you've got. And of course, that's a big issue in China. We see the glamorous high-rises where some Chinese people live, but most Chinese people do not live in houses like that any more than most people in Africa or most people in South America or Central America or Eastern Europe. They don't live in places like that at all. So if we don't do anything, we're going to get two degrees, we're going to get three degrees, we're going to get four degrees, five degrees even before it is completely impossible for us to live here. But that could happen by 2100 if we don't do anything. So that's how serious it is. This is really serious. And the trouble is that these wonderful scientists that have been doing all this research and all coming to the same conclusion for a long time have been dismissed by all of us and accused of not being accurate because, well, they're scientists and they don't want to be inaccurate, but everything looks as if it's heading in this direction. We don't prove it absolutely, but we're starting to be all of the same opinion. I think, ah, scientists, what do you know? Well, they are dis dis describing the universe. That's what they're doing. Right? They're, and they're trying to get a good picture, right? <laughs> and uh, people who deny climate science or want to insist that we're all being somehow sprayed with chemicals from every plane that's coming up, well, it, uh, intentionally chem chemtrails things, or that even that the Earth is flat. <laughs> What's going on? It's like reverse evolution. <laughs> so that's to scare the living daylights out of you, that book. But I've got kids, and when you're around kids and your grandchildren, you've got to be positive. Otherwise, they're going to the counsellor going, I just feel really depressed. And they're right, and they have every right to be. But we can't let them be like that. We have to give them hope. Otherwise, what are we doing? What are we having children for? Why are we bothering to do any of this? We have to do it for our kids and our grandchildren. So, what are we going to do? Here's a book that has 80 different actions humanity can take. Now, that's a warning book, right? This is a top-down book. Every person, a policymaker anywhere in the world should be forced to read that book and do something about it, right? Because that's made by hundreds of scientists and researchers. Right? 80 different actions. And then there's a Another 20, they call coming attractions, of which industrial hemp is one. They didn't know all the facts. They didn't know as much as we've learned in the last day or that I've been accumulating and many, many other people in the last 20 years. So I wrote Paul Hawken, the editor of this book, a letter explaining how actually we were actually doing a whole lot of stuff already that we could prove did that, that, and that, and now we weren't getting to the level of research his guys had done where every single proposal is costed and estimated as to how much carbon being gigatons that would sequester. And it's all sorts of actions like <coughs> designing buildings not to need AC and addressing the recycling of refrigerants because they are thousands of times worse than carbon dioxide. CFCs and HCFCs, they are absolutely atrocious. They will boil us. So how do we get everybody on board with this? Because that's the really difficult thing. It's all very well talking to the converted, but you've got a whole load of your neighbours out there that are either completely unaware or don't care or just don't realise what's going on. So the Transition Handbook is a book that was written maybe about, uh, about eight years ago, nine years ago by a, a friend of mine, and I'm very proud to say that I influenced very slightly the, the, the ideas that caused this book in as much as Rob Hopkins was a permaculture teacher who was teaching the second year... Of, the, of this module that he developed, of this, this course that he developed. And um, he brought me down to, to do some hemp building and hemp plastering. And then a friend of his said, you should show your students this video called The End of Suburbia, which shows how the motor industry and the oil industry destroyed the way that public transport worked and that sort of stuff and made drive-ins and suburbia where you had to drive for miles and got rid of all the buses and trams and all that sort of stuff. And the, if you're going to do that, you should invite this guy, Dr. Colin Campbell, who's an oil geologist. And he was the guy who discovered all the oil in Venezuela. He just happened to live near in West Cork, near where, the, where Rob was teaching in Kinsale. So they showed this video, brought Dr. Colin Campbell in, and basically it's really shocking when you suddenly realise that your dreams are over. That you're actually addicted to this stuff, 
this fossil fuel in such a way that it's just like heroin. And you need, we need, the tools that addiction counsellors use and to address the shock horror of, God, I'm really going to have to start changing my lifestyle, bereavement therapy. That we need to use tools to draw everybody together. So World Cafe, if anybody ever played World Cafe or experienced World Cafe, okay, right, there's some in there. Uh, World Cafe would be, if we were having World Cafe situation, we might have tables where there was maybe 10 or 15 people on a table, and you have a, a, a subject to discuss, and one person is the table keeper, and everybody discusses the idea for five minutes, so all the ideas are jotted down on a piece of paper, which is like the tablecloth, a bunch of pens, and then everybody gets up and moves to different tables, and that happens until everybody's sat at different, all the different tables, and then the table keepers get up at the end of the event and, and describe the sort of culmination of everybody's thoughts. So it's a way of getting everybody to discuss things with each other, come up with all sorts of ideas, crazy or not, and then record those ideas. So we've got some idea of what we actually talked about, because otherwise, if you sort of wander off into the night, you've completely forgotten what you said. So it's a great way of extracting everybody's ideas and finding you know, if we can all agree on something. And that's really important. So all those kind of things are in the transition handbook. And there are transition towns and cities and communities all over the world now that are using this guidebook. Now, it's actually out of print now, but there's a Canadian university who's put it up online in an editable, editable form to try and encourage everybody to be involved. And I would really recommend that you buy those two books and you download that one. So, the other thing, business as usual. These guys, you might know who they are. This is money system now. I call them the ecological illiterati because they are so stupid. Unbelievable. Now, the, the, in a way, you could say the beginning of the sort of real environmental movement was those, that wonderful photograph of Earthrise. But these lunatics are so delusional, they think there's three Earths, right? Now, why? Because, well, because they've created debt to equate to needing to extract resources from th at least three planets. And the last time I looked, there was only one. So he's the ex-president, uh, whatever, of the, of the governor of the Bank of England. That's Timothy Geithner, that's Christine Lagarde, that's Alan Greenspan. I, think I can't remember, but he was the World Bank, and then he got Bernard Bernanke. And those people especially were responsible for the whole lunatic monetarization that happened from Reagan onwards, and that big crash in 2008 where suddenly it didn't work anymore. You couldn't have perpetual growth. And so they've, you can see on the table, there's the growth report, rising forever, because we have to have this growth. And the greed report goes right alongside it. You know, we have more. Well, we can't have more. And if we do have more, thank you for listening. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Thank you, all you guys, Chris and Alex and everybody else. <laughs> Thank you. So I hope I've helped be that catalyst, that lighter of the fire, for you guys in the US and the others that are coming from neighbouring places around to try and help you, that we go in the right direction, that it isn't too crazy and it isn't expecting everything to just be simple and as business as normal, but we need the material. So getting the processing together is really important before you can do any of this fancy stuff called hemp building. Really important because it's impossible. It's like trying to make clothes of that cloth. <laughs> Let's give it up one more time for Steve Allen.